All right, so we're going to get started, and we're going to continue on with uh, chapter 28, of which I have forgotten to post the worksheet, so I'll have to do that at some point. But today, I'm just going to lecture for a bit. So, chapter 28, uh, we're getting into the real components of the central dogma of molecular biology, and chapter 28 is all about DNA and how it replicates. Uh, chapters 10 and 11, you learned about the components of DNA and RNA, that is the nucleotides and some applications with nucleotides. Uh, chapter 11, you learned about chromosomes, which are uh, a eukaryotic thing. You learned about histones and nucleosomes, which are all eukaryotic things. Um, now we get into the actual mechanisms. So, I said this a long time ago when we started with chapter 10, uh, and I reiterated it a couple times. When you go from this point on in the course, DNA replication, transcription, and translation, a majority of questions that you'll be asked about will be about the prokaryotic version of these things. Prokaryotic DNA replication, prokaryotic transcription, and prokaryotic translation. The few things that are eukaryotic will be asked to you in, in sort of like a comparison way, such as, uh, which of the following is uh, similar between prokaryotic and eukaryotic DNA replication? And then you just use your knowledge that you learned in chapter 28 to answer that. So a majority of the lectures will be focusing on prokaryotic stuff, and I will occasionally reference eukaryotic stuff. So to begin with, we are going to do prokaryotic DNA replication. Okay. So... You should know by now that prokaryotic DNA is circular, okay? Uh, eukaryotic DNA, off to the side here. Eukaryotic DNA is linear. So in prokaryotic DNA, the fact that it is circular gives it a bit of an advantage in terms of DNA replication or a difference in terms of DNA replication in that if you open up just one spot in prokaryotic DNA, you'll be able to replicate the entire thing in a reasonable amount of time. Uh, if you were to try to replicate eukaryotic DNA, you'll find that the mechanism to replicate eukaryotic DNA is they make several openings in order to replicate it. So prokaryotic DNA replication, at least in this class, is defined by just having one origin of replication. Meanwhile, eukaryotic DNA, there is many. All right, that's uh, one difference to start with. Now to get into the mechanism of prokaryotic DNA replication. So here's one origin of replication blown up right here. And you see that it has been opened like such. Uh, in a bit, I'll go over the enzymes that you need to know regarding DNA replication, but Right now, we got to go over some core mechanisms here. In one origin of replication, you will have two replication forks. One origin of replication, you have two replication forks. Right here and right here. So what do I mean by replication forks? At your replication forks are a whole bunch of enzymes, which we'll learn later. But just imagine there's a bunch of enzymes over here and over here that are unwinding DNA, reading the template strand of DNA, and replicating it. And then uh, connecting Okazaki fragments together, which I'll talk about later. But for one origin of replication, you have two replication forks. That's true for eukaryotes as well. For each origin of replication that is made, <clears throat> you will have two replication forks. Uh, okay, so. Uh, very critical here is to recognize the direction that DNA is read in, the direction that DNA is made in, and what is your leading and lagging strand. So I'll break that down for you right here. So what I've drawn so far are just the template strands of DNA. We learned that DNA is replicated via semi-conservative replication, which means that each of your individual strands of DNA can be used as template to make new DNA. So let's look on the uh, right side. We're, we're only going to look at the right replication fork right now. This enzyme is trying to read both strands of DNA in order to replicate them. You should know the following. One, DNA 
is only made in a five prime to three prime direction, meaning new nucleotides are only added onto the three prime end of DNA. All right, and, that, and what functional group are you gonna find at the three prime end of DNA? A hydroxyl group. On the three prime end, you will find a hydroxyl group unless there's some special situation that'll be given to you. Normally, the three prime end has a hydroxyl group. And that hydroxyl group is, think of it as like an opening for new nucleotides to be added to it. So, DNA can only be made in a five prime to three prime direction, meaning you need an empty three prime end to add more DNA in. Because of this, the, your, your replication enzymes, which I'll just call polymerases for now, these are the things that make DNA, your polymerases can only make DNA in a five prime to three prime direction, and they do so by reading the template strand in what direction? Three prime to five prime direction, okay? That makes sense because DNA is anti-parallel. The two strands of DNA always have to be anti-parallel to each other. So if you are making new DNA, it needs to be anti-parallel to the template strand. So if DNA can only be made in a five prime to three prime direction, the polymerase must read the template in a three prime to five prime direction. So because of that, let's go look up here. Here's our enzyme. It's going to move this way. It's gonna to move to the right to open up more DNA and, and replicate each strand separately. It's going to move to the right to do that. So you get two different strands that are made in slightly different ways. Why is that? Well, let's see. Our top strand here, since I've divided it in half right now, our top strand here, Five prime is on the left side and three prime is on the right side. Do you guys see that? Down here on the bottom strand, we have three prime on the left side and five prime on the right side. Everyone sees that. Okay, so what this enzyme is gonna do, which, which strand will this enzyme have an easier time of reading if it's moving to the right? The top strand or the bottom strand? The bottom, because polymerases can only read the template three prime to five prime. It's going to have a real easy time reading the bottom strand as it's moving to the right, because it already is going to move to the right to open up more DNA. Luckily, the bottom strand is already in the correct direction of three prime on the left and five prime on the right. So it's gonna open up more DNA and read it simultaneously in order to replicate this DNA. All right, so imagine down here, there's this nice new DNA here. I'm trying to draw with a bolder color right here. That's new DNA that the enzyme had just made and is going to keep extending as it opens up more DNA, as it opens up some more templates. It's going to keep extending this new DNA strand. This new DNA strand on the left side is going to be five prime and on the right side is gonna be three prime, right? New nucleotides are always gonna be added to the three prime end of this thing, okay? All right, well, that feature where the direction of your template strand, the direction that, DNA, that the polymerase reads your template strand is in the direction that the polymerase is moving, if they're going in the same way. So it's going to the right and it's reading this strand in the same direction to the right, that is called your leading strand. Uh, raise your hand if you haven't signed in yet. All right, down there. All right. That is your leading strand. Your leading strand, again, is if the direction the enzyme reads your template strand is in the direction the enzyme is already moving in, that is your leading strand. Let's look at the other one to contrast that. On the other strand, unfortunately, due to its orientation, the enzyme wants to read it going right to left. Why is that? Well, that's because three prime is on the right side and five prime is on the left side up here. And remember, polymerases only read the template three prime to five prime. So it wants to read it in this direction, but it's moving in the opposite direction, right? Because it has to always open up new DNA in order, to, in order to replicate new DNA. So it wants to move in the opposite direction despite wanting to read the template in the right to left direction. That is called your lagging strand whenever they oppose each other, all right? So what ends up happening 
is that your polymerase kind of tricks itself into replicating the lagging strand. I'm not going to be able to draw it here, so I'm going to flip back to the PowerPoint real quick to show you what it does. And I'll come back to my drawing. So, your enzyme ends up tricking itself, and I kind of uh, drew the bottom strand differently from them, but it's the same rules here. Notice that the polymerase ends up tricking itself by forming this loop right here. By forming this loop, it creates a temporary area where it is both moving to the right and reading the template strand from left to right. And it does so by flipping it around. It obviously can't flip around the entire thing. It can only flip around the template strand a little bit. All right? So on my illustration, what that would look like is this spot right here would probably form a loop. The polymerase will form a loop right here, all right, to kind of trick itself into the enzyme wants to move to the right, and by forming a loop, it flips the orientation around in a small region and therefore can replicate DNA going left to right here. This only happens in fragments, so a feature of the lagging strand is you create what? Okazaki fragments, okay? So on the lagging strand, because you can only make DNA a little bit at a time, meaning ones that happen to be in this loop here, you create fragments of new DNA called Okazaki fragments. Yes. Uh, a little bit at a time, yeah. Basically, as new template comes in, it enters that loop. So it's still always one loop. It's just that a uh, new template DNA comes in and gets filtered out that end, or actually I'm pointing the wrong direction, but it, it, it's just always one loop. And as new template DNA comes in, reaches that part of the loop where everything's backwards, it only reads that and replicates a fragment out of that and then brings in the next bit of DNA into that loop. And it does so a little bit at a time. So because of that, you create fragments of DNA called Okazaki fragments, all right? So that is how you tell the difference between leading and lagging strand. A very common exam question will be, you will be given this drawing here with only the directions labeled. You won't have any enzymes drawn in. You won't have any fragments drawn in. You'll only have the directions 5 prime, 3 prime, 3 prime, 5 prime labeled. And they'll have each of these corners, A, B, C, and D labeled. And they'll ask which strands are your leading strands, or which strands are your lagging strands, or other ways to ask this, which strands are made continuously, or which ones are made discontinuously, okay? So, let's practice on the left side here. So, uh, to help you along with this, my suggestion would be to draw this dividing line in your origin of replication and label your directions. So looking at the left half of my diagram here, if five prime is on the left of the top strand, that must mean this must be three prime there. And on the bottom strand, if three prime is on the left here, that means that must mean five prime is there uh, as indicated. Okay, that makes things a little bit easier. Here's our enzyme. We know it's at this replication fork and we know it's moving to the left because the other one is moving to the right. This one has to be moving to the left. Someone tell me which strand, either A or C, which one is your leading strand? Raise your hand if you think A. Raise your hand if you think C. All right, let's see. Let's find out, okay? The key rule is this one. The polymerase can only read the template in a 3' prime to 5' prime direction. So for our left half of our diagram here, which one is the three prime to five prime direction? It is A. The enzyme wants to move to the left because this replication fork is moving to the left. It is then reading the top strand in the perfect direction because the enzyme already is moving to the left. It is going to read the top strand three prime to five prime moving to the left. So that's the key thing is pay attention to what direction the enzyme wants to move and what direction it'll be reading each template strand in. The top strand happens to be pointing three prime to five prime in the same direction the enzyme wants to move. And when they are both pointing in the same direction, that means this is your leading strand. Let's just check the uh, bottom strand just to make sure. The bottom strand, notice three prime is over here and five prime is there. So on the bottom strand, strand C, although the enzyme wants to move to the left, it's going to try to read the template that way. 
So it has to trick itself, right? It's going to, I'm not really gonna draw a good example of it here, but it's gonna try to form a loop down here to trick itself into replicating it. So the bottom strand on the left half here is your lagging strand. All right, so the rules or tricks to figure out which strand is which is always figure out one, what direction is the replication fork moving? So what direction are you opening up DNA? So in our left half example, the replication fork is moving to the left. And two, what direction is enzyme reading template? If your answer to both one and two is the same, that is your leading strand. Yes, question. Uh, yes. Uh, well, in, in this class, you assume for prokaryotes and eukaryotes that they always replicate both strands of DNA. Yes. Um, in genetics, there or, or in microbio, bacteria do um, rolling circle replication or something, but we don't care about that here. But yeah, always in this class, simplified as in they break it open into two halves and synthesize DNA simultaneously. Just in one is continuous and the other one is discontinuous. Yes. Question. Either one of you. Okay, mm -hmm. so, so on the exam, mm -hmm. it was like, okay, what is the lagging strand? Yep. So it would be B and C. Yep, it would be B and C for your lagging strands. Yes, exactly. So it's like different on the class, so we were Yes, and that's, that's the, actually a key point, is whatever half you are looking at, it'll be a diff, the diff, uh, one side will be a leading strand, the other side will be lagging strand. They will not be the same on each half. Notice that they are mirror image, well, I guess not mirror images, flipped images with each other. That the lagging strand on the right is at the top and the lagging strand on the left is at the bottom. That is also a kind of a shortcut way that you can use for the exam is that if you just look at one half and you figure out which one is leading and lagging, flip that around when you look at the other half. All right, that is, how, how this type of DNA replication symmetry works. Yes? Yeah. It, uh, no, it'll be presented to you in a format. If you look at the practice exam, in fact, there'll probably be uh, something that you'll be able to see, but they'll draw like this shape with this opening and they'll label five prime, three prime, and three prime, five prime, and that's all the information you'll be given. Oh, and then of course each corner will have A, B, C, D. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. So, after you figure out leading strand and lagging strand, again, he can ask it to you in many different ways, such as which ones will have Okazaki fragments. You now know that's a fancy way of asking which one is the lagging strand. Uh, there will be other things you will find, such as which one will you find DNA polymerase one in, which you will learn later is another way of saying which one is the lagging strand. Uh, and we'll get to that in a bit. Uh, let me see if there's anything else. Yeah, so the key features, figure out what direction, uh, whoops, what direction replication fork is moving and figure out what direction the enzyme is reading the template. If they are pointing in the same direction, like this example here, <coughs> That is your leading strand. If they are pointing in opposite directions, like the bottom right here, that is your lagging strand. And you can do this for each half if you want. Okay. Uh, any questions on identifying leading and lagging strand on a diagram such as this? All right. All right. So let me see what's next real quick. I believe it's the enzymes next. Yes, okay. So, we will talk about this one, three, da, da, da. Okay, all right. So, very important here. DNA replication enzymes. 
Like I said, prokaryotic information is the most important compared to eukaryotic. So everything I'm going to list here is just for prokaryotic DNA replication. When we get to eukaryotic, I'll list the enzymes there as well, and you can compare and contrast the two lists to each other. So for DNA replication of prokaryotes. All right, so let's see. We have our replication fork. I'm only drawing the right half this time. Uh, five prime to three prime, three prime to five prime. Repli replication fork is going to the right. Uh, which strand, the top strand or the bottom strand, do you think is going to be the leading strand this time? It is the bottom one because here's three prime here and there's five prime there on the bottom strand. It wants to read the template strand going left to right. Your enzymes will want to read the template strand going left to right because it reads the template three prime to five prime, which is the same direction that the replication fork is opening. Therefore, the bottom strand needs to be your leading strand. And process of elimination, that means the top strand is your lagging strand. Okay. Now, what enzymes are involved? Usually the first enzyme that is listed when we talk about DNA replication is helicase. Anyone know what helicase does? It unzips the DNA, exactly. So, not drawn here, and I am not going to draw because there's a bunch of enzymes here. There is a helicase enzyme somewhere up here that is opening up DNA so that the enzymes behind it can replicate it. So the very first enzyme to talk about is helicase because it unzips DNA. All right. The act of opening DNA, of unwinding DNA, creates supercoiling elsewhere in your uh, genome. We have a series of enzymes to fix that supercoiling. What category of enzymes is that called? Topoisomerases, exactly. So we do have to talk about that. So also somewhere up here, also, so we have helicase there. We also have topoisomerases there. Uh, one specific one that is always talked about starts with a G. Anyone know what it's called? Gyrase, exactly. So topoisomerase slash gyrase fixes supercoiling. Because whenever you unwind DNA in one spot, it creates supercoiling elsewhere, which you constantly have to be fixing, otherwise the whole thing is gonna break apart. All right? After you unwind DNA, there's a series of proteins that work to make sure DNA stays unwound from each other so that DNA replication can work. You see an acronym, SSB, which stands for single-stranded binding proteins. Single-stranded binding proteins, whose job is to keep unwound DNA, is to keep it unwound, to prevent it from just rewinding back together before it can finish replication. So single-stranded binding proteins, they're kind of like right here, I guess. They draw them a bunch of places. It keeps DNA unwound, prevents it from winding back together, and then you waste your, 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 your time here. So it keeps it unwound. Single-strand binding proteins keeps DNA single-stranded. All right. The next one... In order to perform DNA replication, you need a short RNA sequence called a primer, okay? Uh, I'll try to illustrate where that would go, but it's a little bit hard sometimes. But at the very start of DNA replication, actually, yeah, that, that's not going to look good on this diagram. Um, but basically, whenever you want to start any type of DNA replication, it must start with a primer. Otherwise, the enzyme doesn't know where to even begin replicating DNA. So, a primer is needed, which is made by an enzyme called primase. Okay, an enzyme that makes an RNA primer. That isn't a typo. The primer is made of RNA when you do DNA replication. Part of the reason why it's made of RNA is two things. 
One, it is easier to attach RNA as a temporary construct on DNA. Uh, and you, you only need the primer there to be there temporarily so that DNA replication enzymes know where to go in order to replicate the rest of your DNA. So RNA primer is like a short RNA sequence that allows DNA polymerases to know where to begin replicating DNA. And the enzyme that makes the primer is called primase. All right, now we get to the main important enzyme. In prokaryotes, this enzyme makes a majority of your DNA. It is called DNA polymerase three. Roman numeral three, okay? This is your main one that makes a majority of your DNA in prokaryotes, meaning it replicates the leading strand, replicates all of the leading strand, and it also replicates the Okazaki fragments on your lagging strand. It makes the Okazaki fragments. which is a majority of the DNA on the lagging strand, but not all of it, technically. Okazaki fragments are a majority of DNA on the lagging strand, but there's little gaps in between the Okazaki fragments. It turns out we use a separate enzyme to fill in those gaps. So if I were to draw some Okazaki fragments on here. So DNA polymerase three made all of those. But what do we do about the spaces in between them? There's another enzyme that takes care of that called DNA polymerase one. All right, and we'll actually spend more detail on DNA polymerase one uh, in a second, but just listing the enzymes right now. So helicase unzips the DNA. Topoisomerase and gyrase work to fix supercoiling because when you open up DNA in one spot, it, it makes supercoiling elsewhere. Single-stranded binding proteins are what keep DNA in a single-stranded form so that you can replicate it. Primase creates RNA primers so that DNA polymerase knows where to replicate DNA. And then the actual main DNA polymerase in prokaryotes is this one right here, DNA polymerase three. It replicates all of the DNA on your leading strand and most of the DNA on your lagging strand. The reason why I use the word most is that it technically only makes the Okazaki fragments. And lastly, DNA polymerase one is involved in something called NIC translation, which is the next thing I'll talk about. NIC translation is the act of filling in these gaps between Okazaki fragments on your lagging strand. That is what NIC translation is, is fill in gaps, okay, on lagging strand. All right, and we'll get to how it does that in a bit. I have to go into more detail about DNA polymerase three and one first. Yes, question. So all primers does is mm -hmm. Yes, and it does so by making the primer. The primer is the one that technically is like the signal for where DNA polymerase should begin DNA replication. And, yes, and it's an RNA primer, yes. Uh, key feature there, all the RNA primer does is it provides a three prime OH. I should have stated that. What's the point of a primer? All it does is provides a three prime hydroxyl group. Why? Well, DNA polymerase can only make new DNA in a five prime to three prime direction. So it needs to know where to start attaching nucleotides to. So that's all a primer does is it gives a three prime OH. So, it knows, so DNA polymerase knows where to begin adding nucleotides to. Uh, let's see if there's anything else. Three, one, I think that's everything so far. All right, any questions? Yes. Mm -hmm. for, for DNA replication, if I were to draw the central dogma real quick, really it's kind of its own thing. Uh, here's DNA to RNA to protein, and transcription is this thing to go between DNA and RNA. Translation is this thing, 
to go between RNA and protein. Replication is kind of usually drawn like this. DNA replicates itself. Okay, so that's kind of where it goes in the central dogma. All right, so let me uh, flip back to the PowerPoint, make sure I didn't skip anything, because I know I have to go over specifics of enzymes. Okay, that is the next thing, all right. Oh yeah, the clean-out fragment. I gotta remember to talk about the clean-out fragment. Okay, so. DNA polymerase three. The important one. DNA pole three. Uh, you'll see is made of several subunits. All right, and actually I always forget the letters. I know alpha and beta are in there. Let me just check real quick. Da, da, da. Let's see, alpha, beta, epsilon, and theta. Let me write those down for you. Alpha, beta, epsilon, and theta. Okay. What we mean by subunits is, remember back in exam one, that you have some proteins that are in a quaternary structure. A quaternary structure is a big protein that is made of smaller components called subunits. So DNA polymerase three is made of four subunits. An alpha subunit, which is the main one, this one, you'll read somewhere in there, it'll say it has a five prime to three prime polymerase activity. Okay, beta will also be referred to as the beta sliding clamp, which I'll explain what that is in a bit. Epsilon, you will see will have written next to it, three prime to five prime exonuclease. They may even shorten that to just three prime exonuclease. So either one means the same thing. So I'll actually put that in parentheses also. Sometimes this is just written as three prime exonuclease. It means the same thing. I'll explain what that is later. And theta, which last I remember, they don't actually know what it does. Let me, and therefore it doesn't matter to you guys either. Let me just make sure. Yeah, still don't know. Got it. All right. What does each of these mean? So, in your polymerase 3, the alpha subunit is the one that is making DNA. The alpha subunit is the one with the polymerase activity. It's the one that is bringing in new nucleotides, reading the template strand, and attaching a corresponding nucleotide to an extending new DNA strand. That is this one's job. And you can tell by the name of its activity, 5 prime to 3 prime polymerase. Add more nucleotides, add more uh, DNA polymer from 5 prime to 3 prime. The sliding clamp, this thing, and let me see if they have a nice illustration of this. Basically all this thing does is keeps DNA polymerase 3 bound to the template strand. Sometimes there's a nice picture, yeah, okay. Okay, this blue blob right here is DNA polymerase three. There's a special subunit of DNA polymerase three called the beta sliding clamp whose job is to make sure DNA polymerase three doesn't fall off the template strand. That's all its job is, is to keep DNA polymerase three stuck to the template and make sure it keeps going. What this leads to is a phrase called processivity, that DNA polymerase 3 has enormous processivity somewhere. Mm -hmm. Here we go. This, that beta sliding clamp gives DNA polymerase 3 enormous processivity. What that means is DNA polymerase 3 can synthesize an enormous amount of nucleotide bases without a break. It can just keep on going and going and going. All right? That is not a feature seen in every DNA polymerase that we talk about. So only ones in prokaryotes, only DNA polymerase 3 has a beta sliding clamp, and therefore only DNA polymerase 3 has enormous processivity in prokaryotes. All right, and that's because of the beta sliding clamp. The last subunit, other than the unknown one, which we don't care about, 
is this one, the epsilon subunit. It contains an activity called three prime exonuclease, or three prime to five prime exonuclease. This one, you will see in your notes, is sometimes written as the editor of this enzyme. It is the editor. What this means is DNA polymerase three is not perfect. Sometimes it puts in the incorrect nucleotide during DNA replication. When it puts in the incorrect nucleotide, remember it puts it in a five prime to three prime direction. If it, puts it in the, if it puts in the wrong nucleotide, it needs to go backwards a little bit in order to fix it. That backwards editing function where it checks the last nucleotide it put in and checks to make sure it's, it's the correct one, that editing function is this one, the three prime exonuclease. When a wrong base is added, the DNA polymerase three has a special subunit to fix it. This enzyme will remove the wrong nucleotide and then the alpha subunit will try to put in the correct one this time. Okay, so the alpha subunit is trying to put in nucleotides. Sometimes it makes a mistake. The epsilon subunit removes the mistakes and the alpha subunit puts the correct one in the second time. Annoying part of this, uh, def these definitions in this class is the following. On the exam, they will sometimes ask, which activity is your proofreader and which activity is your editor? Okay, so be very careful with that. The editor is what we've listed here. The editor's job is to remove mistakes. So they are your editor is your three prime exonuclease to remove mistakes. But your proofreader activity, the one that even finds the mistake in the first place, is actually your alpha subunit, the five prime to three prime polymerase. The reason why I say this is annoying is that if you uh, take the MCAT, I believe they group both of these activities to the three prime exonuclease function. Okay, so for the MCAT, you have to memorize it as both the proofreading and editing function is three prime exonuclease. Uh, for this class, they are two different subunits handle each function. So I'm listing that here. This is for this class. Okay. So again, why is that? The reason why that is, is biochemically speaking, what is this enzyme's job? This enzyme's job is to add nucleotides to a template strand. Every time it adds a nucleotide, it's like it's trying to test two puzzle pieces together and see if they fit. If it brings in one and doesn't fit in correctly, it knows it has made a mistake and must call its editor to remove the mistakenly added nucleotide, and then it's gonna try, and then the polymerase is gonna try again to put in the correct one. So this subtle difference, I stress every semester, because other classes teach it different ways. For this class, you have to separate the proofreading activity is this activity, and the editor activity is this one, okay? Uh, and I think that's all the activities for DNA polymerase three. Any questions so far on the activities of DNA polymerase three? This is all it does, are these listed activities. Okay, we will now contrast this with DNA polymerase 1. Feature number 1 to contrast DNA polymerase 3 with DNA polymerase 1 is that there is only one subunit for DNA polymerase 1 compared to DNA polymerase 3. Therefore, DNA polymerase 1 is relatively simple. It is just one subunit rather than a bunch of them put together. Okay? That one subunit, confusingly, has three activities just by itself. Con contrast that to DNA polymerase 3 where you had one activity for each of these subunits. For DNA polymerase 1, one single subunit has three activities of which we will list right now. The first activity, 5' prime to 3' prime polymerase. The second activity, 3' prime exonuclease, which is also known as 3' prime to 5' prime exonuclease. So, so far, it has the exact same activities as DNA polymerase 3, it's just on one subunit this time. The last bit here, the last activity here is another thing to contrast is that it also has something called 5' prime to 3' prime exonuclease. Okay? It also has something called 5' prime to 3' prime exonuclease. So that's only in DNA polymerase 1. 
DNA polymerase 3 does not have this thing, and that's because this extra activity allows DNA polymerase 1 to do uh, what is called NIC translation, which I'll pull up a diagram for in a second. It all has to do with this extra activity that DNA polymerase 1 has. So again, I must stress because there are questions on the exam that will ask this, such as <clears throat> how many activities does DNA polymerase 1 have versus how many subunits does it have, okay? So memorize these facts that I've given you here. DNA polymerase 3 is several subunits with several activities. DNA polymerase 1 is three activities with all stuffed on one subunit. How is it able to do this? You learned in exam 2 material, chapter 13, that some enzymes have multiple active sites. It turns out DNA polymerase 1 has three different active sites for each activity that it has. Contrast that with DNA polymerase 3, where each subunit has an active site. All right, so key feature, DNA polymerase 1, multiple active sites on DNA polymerase 1 because all three activities are on a single subunit. All right. <clears throat> okay, so what is NIC translation? Let me go to a picture. Nick translation is finishing your Okazaki fragments, is putting them together because there's gaps in between your Okazaki fragments. This is done in a few steps. Oh, and, I, and now I just remembered, I always forget this last enzyme in the list of enzymes, DNA ligase. I'll get to it in a little bit. Anyways, so on your lagging strand, you have a gap in between this Okazaki fragment on the left and an Okazaki fragment on the right. Also annoyingly, is that remember how you need a primer to do DNA replication? Every single Okazaki fragment in the lagging strand has a primer on it, meaning every single Okazaki fragment has a few nucleotides that are RNA rather than DNA. So there's a whole mess on the lagging strand. There's gaps between Okazaki fragments and there's RNA primers all over the place. This enzyme's job, DNA polymerase 1's job, is to fix all of that. The way it works, is one. DNA polymerase one fills in the gap between Okazaki fragments. That's what it's doing. It's filling in this gap here. The next thing it does, so this is all what's called NIC translation, which is finishing off the Okazaki fragments. The next thing is it does is that when it runs into a primer, because as it's filling in the gaps, it's gonna run into an RNA primer, it actually destroys it. It gets rid of the RNA primer and replaces it with actual DNA, okay? Again, the lagging strand has tons of primers on it. It's a big mess because of, you have to restart replication several times on the lagging strand. So this enzyme, DNA polymerase 1's job, is to remove those primers and put in actual DNA. The enzyme I forgot to list earlier, and you should add to your notes, is DNA ligase. DNA ligase, its job is to seal the nick between your Okazaki fragments. DNA ligase does not add any nucleotides. The nick that they are talking about at the very end here is the nick between two phosphodiester bonds, okay? You know the backbone, that sugar phosphate backbone that is in all DNA strands? DNA ligase's job is to combine the sugar phosphate backbone between two uh, Okazaki fragments. DNA polymerase 1 did all the hard work. DNA polymerase 1 removed the primers, put in the nucleotides, and then it got tired, so then DNA ligase comes in and finishes off that little bit to connect the sugar phosphate backbone together between your, your Okazaki fragments. And that's what you have right here. This is the fully completed lagging strand with all your Okazaki fragments put together. DNA polymerase 1 and DNA ligase will go do this between every single Okazaki fragment. There is a question over here? Good? Okay. So DNA polymerase 1 and DNA ligase will go close the nick between every single Okazaki fragment. And that process itself is called uh, uh, nick translation. The reason why only DNA polymerase 1 can do this is because of that third activity that I gave you. This one listed right here, 5' prime to 3' prime exonuclease. This activity, its sole job is to remove strands of nucleotides ahead of the enzyme. 
Contrast this with the other exonuclease, three prime to five prime exonuclease. That one's job was whenever there was one nucleotide mistake, it went backwards one to fix it. This exonuclease's job is to look ahead of the enzyme rather than backwards, is to look ahead of the enzyme and whenever it finds RNA nucleotides in this example, it'll remove it. And then the rest of the enzyme, the, the polymerase activity can fill it in with DNA. All right, we'll end, we'll end for now and I'll continue uh, with this explanation uh, next time.